and welcome to Tremendous Tales with me, Liz Pichon, the podcast where I chat to my guests about all the important things in life, like snacks and books. My guest today is the fabulous and very talented Laura Dockrell. She's an award-winning writer and illustrator whose first book for children, Darcy Burdock, was shortlisted for the Waterstones Book of the Year Prize and long-listed for the Carnegie Medal. Her young adult novels, Lorelei and Big Bones, were also shortlisted for the YA Book Prize in 2018. Laura's writing has expanded to stage and screen, and her first film, Goldfish, received a BAFTA nomination for Best Short. She's been commissioned from the National Theatre, The Young Vic and The Donmar Warehouse. Other commissioned works include short stories, scripts and poems for the BFI, which is the British Film Institute, BBC Radio, Channel 4 and the British Council. Laura's picture book, Angry Cookie, illustrated by Maria Caripadu, is currently in workshop at the Royal Festival Hall. Laura's first adult non-fiction memoir, What Have I Done?, is in development with Pulse Films, who have secured the TV rights with Laura on board to write the adaptation. I last saw Laura reading one of her short stories on a live radio recording with some very fancy guests watching on. And in that situation, I would have been an absolute bag of nerves. But Laura was incredible, and as was her story. So welcome, Laura. Do you remember that evening? Yeah, I do. I can't believe you. I didn't even know you were there, did Oh, yeah, I? I was there. I was, I, I do you was... know what? The whole thing was a blur. I've seen you since then at the Guard. Surely you've come and done the, come the couple of the Guardian masterclasses. I, m- maybe I did that afterwards, but I remember that evening so vividly because mm. you were reading out a, this brilliant story and you were having to do it in front of lots of very literary, well, I say lots of very literary people. It was Hilary Mantel, I think, as well. Yes, yes, yes. I know. And I was thinking, oh, and it was live. And I just thought, gosh, I'd be so nervous about it. But you were absolutely brilliant. Do you enjoy doing all that side of it then? Mm, you know, I really, I at first was like, oh, no, the world's closing in. And now being able to talk from the comfort of like where it all happens. I'm, I don't know if you feel the same at my desk. I do feel a little bit kind of cosier um, than being thrust on stage. I think there's kind of a stereotype, isn't there, with writers that we're like, you know, live in attics and we wear like tea stained nighties and, you know, <laughs> Although that does kind happen. of these... Dickensian poets, absolutely, it does happen a lot. Um, so actually, being thrust onto the stage is like I, you, no one tells you that you also have to be the like Lady Gaga as well and get on stage and do all of that, <laughs> and then you suddenly do have to. I also feel I don't know if you feel this, but in children's work, it, you feel sometimes like um, it's a safety zone, but you get that fraud thing a little bit more. You don't feel quite literary enough, and actually, when you're doing it. It takes far more work to write for children than it does adults because they sniff you out. And if they're mm-hmm. not interested and mm-hmm. they know that you're a fraud, you can't get away with it. Yeah, no. They're that's... not just going to be nice. No, that's so true. That's so true. Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely have the imposter syndrome thing about where, especially when you go to those sort of events and you're looking around. And I think especially with children's books as well, I always feel like... Um, some you know children's books you know we sell a lot of books <laughs> and it's really important that you know the children's book side of things and I do think sometimes at the events you do feel a bit like um, you are at on the children's table <laughs> totally totally and then it's funny when the um author you know and some I, I've had authors say oh I want to write a children's book now for something a little bit simpler and I'm like or a little bit easier I'm mm-hmm. like okay good luck yeah it, I always think it's, it's just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm absolutely with you on that. And it's it's always like, um, oh, would you ever um, do something? Would you ever like to change and, you know, do do a real book, like do an adult book or something? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I, I definitely think Actually, that. when my adult book came out, I had to keep being like, this is a book for adults. And everyone goes, ooh, an adult. He's like, no, no, not like that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> so did you ever imagine then when you were a kid did you ever imagine that this is what you'd be doing that this is the kind of work that you'd be doing that you'd be writing books and performing and you know writing scripts and things like that um I think this was always my dream but I think at um school it seemed impossible all the books that I'd ever read or the authors that I learned about were either men or they were dead and I sort of <laughs> thought that's what you had to be <laughs> to get this break you know I I never thought and I thought maybe when I'm really you know much older plus my spelling and grammar isn't very strong so at school all my work on the page would be covered in you know I'd have the story I'd have the imagination I'd have the language but then this big ugly red pen would come out and circle mm-hmm. and be like oh try better next time we'll see me and it takes a lot you know of courage and resilience to just keep going for that a determination 
And then secondary school really exhausted me. I just mm. didn't feel smart. I didn't feel like I, I just felt in the middle all the time of ev- everything. And uh, that really dampened my flair and my interest in creativity. So I actually found the performance stuff was a way a way in really in a kind oh, of mother right. goose meets lady gaga <laughs> where i thought <laughs> i would get found you know if i read the work out loud i don't think i would have been published if i had just submitted on paper because all my flaws would have been at the surface so um yeah in answer to your question yes you know but i always wanted to be a kind of french and saunders kind of bottom mr bean meets it's not you know, too late, Laura. Books that I grew up with. No, it's not too late. I just need to get myself some red tights and just shove my school shirt into them, and then I can be Rick Mail. Um, so uh, yeah, and then my family, my dad taught me, you know, to love music. You know, lyrics are so important to mm. me, and um, he would always tell me the backstories of how songs came about. You know, from Marvin Gaye to John Cooper Clark, and I, I, that was such an important part of my learning. It wasn't just books; it was music, film, TV, yeah. comedy, food, everything, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think as well, I've just I just showed um, Laura the uh, Gatefold Tom Gates album that Mark and I. I know it looks make. amazing, and the music's amazing for this show, guys. Well, we just <laughs> well, it's one of those memories that I have as a kid as being given like my um, I've got older brothers and sisters, and you know if I used to go and visit their, you know, they'd moved out and they had their own places, you know, they had a record collection. Um, and so we used to go over and visit and after I get bored after they'd stick me in the corner and I'd be allowed to choose an album or they'd put an album on and they always had much nicer stereo systems than my mum and dad that had something that looked like a tease made, you know, <laughs> you know, the old cassette had, had everything with it. So I have really strong memories of putting on these incredible headphones and listening to uh, Stevie Wonder like for the first time and studying the gatefold and looking at the lyrics and mm. I got given an album I got uh, played an album called The Point by Harry Nilsson which had a little um, illustrated book in it as well and you know just the whole thing it was a story and it had lots of songs with it and it just really for me you know it's, it was all about another way of telling stories wasn't it it's like reading the lyrics totally. you know, hearing the music totally. looking at the artwork you know, studying it. it's all part of the same thing isn't it that's oh, it really is. And when I, to- you're right, when I go to schools and kids go, oh, I don't like books or, you know, it's not for me, but they all like but they all like songs and music. Yeah. That's just essentially a way of absorbing a story, you know, just in another format. So I always say, there's actually a really good book. I really enjoyed it by Jay-Z um, called Decoded, where he annotates his lyrics. Can I just like say, I've just had to Mark's, Mark's writing that down. Oh, <laughs> it's <laughs> Ooh, really good. good. <laughs> so he breaks down his, um, his raps, you know, like songs and um that kind of but we need more of that because they're the this is just another format of storytelling and essentially it is just spoken word it's just got music behind it so everything is feeding into everything we're all talking about the little books and the things that come inside you know that's what i'm missing so much in this kind of spotify world is i'm missing all the extra it's that's physical, such an opportunity isn't it? yeah that's it really is. interesting because i always i mean like, i used to give music as a present a lot you know yeah. you give, so, give somebody an album and so i mean that's part of the reason that we did that it was a, something special you know because you could look at it and take it out and um, and i i must admit though that the sort of novelty of having to turn the album over after about <laughs> Oh, God, you know, we've got to get up. And watching our kids as well, who are, who are older, the first time we got a record player in the house, they were sort of hovering over with the needle and said, well, which end do we start at? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I was CD world, but CD, oh. you've got your favourite CD and then it gets scratched and then you're like, ow. Yeah, you know, I remember that's... watching it on, um, I think it was a programme called Tomorrow's World before when CDs first came out and they were supposed to be indestructible. They had this whole thing about how, you know, they could roll over it in a in a car and stuff and nothing would happen to it and it's just a load of rubbish (laughs) well also the funny thing is they scratch so easily they literally get a whisper of air on them and they scratch but if you're annoyed and it's like your ex-boyfriend cd and you try and snap it you're there like (laughs) (laughs) and it just won't snap when you need it to (laughs) snack chat do you have any kind of like really strong um memories about snacks in when you were at school or school dinners well i spent most of my teens 
being a chubby grunger. Um, so just basically like loving grunge music. Yeah, it does. Uh, my partner who I'm with now, um, I actually fancied him and was his best friend since we were 14 years old. Oh. So he always thinks it's hilarious because I, well, he said you would always come with like puddle water up to your knees, you know, drenched from my baggy jeans that I would always have on. Oh, that's the reason nobody ever kissed me. <laughs> um, in primary school, I was just geeky, a goody goody. You know, I had one, one friend and loved books. Books were my absolute companion and I loved reading um, poetry too. So I always had that from a young age. My dad, I have him to thank for that because he always, you know, I wasn't spoiled as a child, but if it came to books, he would never say no to a book, mm. you know, from Jacqueline Wilson and Carol Ann Duffy. You know, I was just always reading um, Colin McNaughton, um, Benjamin Zephaniah, anyone I could get my hands on. So uh, that's the kind of kid I was with snacks. So as I was uh, definitely had an addiction to baked potatoes, jacket <laughs> potatoes, chips. Food was a massive part of me growing up. And actually why I wrote Big Bones, my teen book, was because I got to the, you know, I, you know grow, grew up and I was like, wow, I think I spent all of my teens pretending I didn't like food to look cool and to kind of punish myself. So I wanted to write that love letter to food. Mm. Um, I found all these diaries from when I was younger being like, oh, I hate my body and all the rest of it. And I was like, imagine if I looked at these diaries and they were going, you know what, you look great. Um, how refreshing that would have found uh, felt. So that's kind of why I did Big Bones. So snacks are really important to me. And um, I really want to try and now have my own little child, you know, my own little boy to make sure that food is really positive in the house and mm. encouraged and cooking and eating is so, because it's especially with the pandemic, it's been so important. Yeah, definitely. So Laura, would you like to tell us about um, your snack of choice, which I am genuinely very excited about? So I've chosen, uh, as soon as I was, you know, your snack is always so glamorous. You love those caramel bars, don't you? Um, and they come in like the fanciest paper. Mine doesn't come in any fancy paper. Mine is a snack that you can create at home. Anybody can do it, but you have to be a Marmite fan. Mm hmm. Which is controversial, I understand. Uh, I'm I not in my, already, no, not in my world, it's not. You love Marmite, <laughs> Maybe in Australia. <laughs> so, you know, um, apparently Marmite is like using the fifth... There's this new sense, right? The new taste called Unami, which is this kind of marmite flavour. So it's been recognised now, officially... You know, you've got salt, sweetie, sweet, bitter. Yeah. And now this is Marmite, that distinct flavour that you get in this or miso or soy sauce. Oh. It's completely addictive and I love anything that tastes like this. I think this is my third round. So mine's really soft. So this is basically, basically your snack of choice is Marmite on toast. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> it's Marmite on toast. So um, can we discuss this? So what is there anything else on there? Do you put butter on it? Is it heaps of butter, yeah. drowned in butter, any bread. I could eat it off any bread, yeah. but obviously thick white bread, doorstop bread is obviously mm -hmm. the way to do it. Yeah. It has to be toast. I will eat a Marmite sandwich. I will eat a Marmite Jacob's cracker, but it has to be toast. Um, yeah. Toasted is the great way for me. And I, loads of it. I, do you know, it's really funny because I'm... This sounds really fancy, but Marmite is the only thing that I take with me if I have to go and do, if I'm abroad or I'm doing a sort of book, book. I take a pillow <laughs> and Marmite. Now that's the fancy bit. That's, that's the, the snobby bit, bit yeah. your own pillow. Very small, very small pillow that you kind of roll up. like so. and The take, Marmite's understandable. I take a jar of Marmite as well. Cause like, Good. You know, but, yeah, breakfast and stuff, you always get lots of sweet things all the time. And sometimes you don't want to eat you know, like anything hot or anything. So Marmite is just, it's one thing that I really miss. And when I was a kid, I would, I had a relatively long journey, especially when I was going to secondary school. And I'd be on the train coming back, like literally just working out what I was going to eat when I got, <laughs> got in. You know, you just open the door and go, what shall I eat? And it's usually, it was toast, toast and Marmite. So, and there's something really lovely about the packaging as well. Oh, it's beautiful. It's really classic. And, um, so, you know, I have a memory of I used to go and stay at my um, godfather's house all the time. And um, he is a vegetarian. And I used to think that Marmite was like the ultimate uh, nectar of the vegetarian gods. Mm -hmm. You know, he used to this massive jar. That I've still never seen a jar the size of it would just be on his big wooden table with a spoon and just a loaf of bread. Just kind of there, ready at your pleasing to go and have a wedge of it. So I also found out recently um, that a nurse told me that Marmite is encouraged in... Um, Hot, can be encouraged in hospitals or when people are recovering because it actually brings an appetite on. That's why I eat like 12 slices. 
<laughs> well, I think a lot, a lot of the hospital food, yeah. You'd be quite happy to have Marmite. That would be the thing. But I put a spoonful in bolognese sauce. I put spoonfuls in chilli. Oh, okay. It just adds... De- I am actually um, vegan, so it gives me... It gives, like, a kind of real, uh, I guess, meatiness to you, depth yeah. to, and richness to everything. So I just value it so much. And... Uh, we haven't even talked about the fact there was a shortage recently after the. Um, oh, yes, there is. We we did we did realise that there was a shortage. So we yeah you see if you're only a true addict could have realised that. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, it's because the pubs rely on the old beer yeast oh. um, to make the marmite, and because the pubs were closed, nobody could have their marmite. So I said to my dad, "Please keep drinking all that beer because it's helping me." <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> It's like when I went to Australia, you know, they always try to sort of palm you off with Vegemite. The Vegemite. Like, it's just not the same. <laughs> it tastes like... I will go for it. If I can't have Marmite, I'll go for it. So I absolutely, we, we completely approve of your snack of choice, which is Marmite with butter on any kind of toast. Absolutely. The ultimate comfort food. The ultimate comfort food. Tremendous tales. Laura, we're talking to everybody about a tremendous tale. So have you got a tremendous tale that you'd like to share with our listener? (laughs) Yeah, I thought I would share with you the fact that I never, um, I nearly never became um, a writer, well, a writer in the weight sense that I am now telling stories live. Because when I was a baby and I got my first tooth, I actually bit into a tub of superglue and my mouth got stuck together. Oh, oh no. (laughs) And my mouth got stuck together. So what happened was my mum was washing up. She'd bought the shopping bag and the super glue in the carrier bag on the floor. And I just got my first little two teeth and I bit into the tube of super glue and it completely filled my mouth. You know, I'm greedy. If it's there, I'm going to eat it. (laughs) And um, my mum was washing up. Like taking huge (laughs) deeps of breath. Oh, oh no. Yeah, imagine if I said my comfort food is actually super glue on toes. (laughs) No, um, (laughs) and um, I, my mum was washing up at the time and she just span around luckily and threw the whole washing up bowl down my throat and it actually, you know, remove the super glue but when I got rushed to A&E and everything and when they got there they said it was so lucky that my mum had done that because obviously I was still so tiny and little and it could have really have damaged me so um now my mum always says oh god if only that super glue would have worked maybe you would have <laughs> shut up <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the sort of thing isn't it that's just the sort of thing that, that you need to be reminded of oh no that's terrible that's a really yeah, we're, well lucky for all of us I think that that didn't happen Laura I can safely say <laughs> there are all those things, aren't there, that, uh, that that peril when children are really little. It's like oh, when our kids were oh. sort of little, they just the, when they get to that sort of head height when they're just starting to walk, and it just seems like my son's got he's got this massive scar on his head where he sort of ran into a. Um, I was holding some chocolate bunnies, so technically it was my fault. Of course, and he saw them and ran towards them and just didn't see the edge of a filing cabinet. <laughs> and oh. Just. And he's got like a sort of Harry Potter scar on there, which is... And then and I was able to comfort him by giving him the chocolate bunnies. I was about bunnies. to say, he must have got the reward, right? While he, while he was bleeding, like, <laughs> so profusely. And we decided it worked so well that actually that every first aid kit should have a packet of chocolate bunnies in it. I remember I broke my wrist once at school by playing a game and I tripped on the carpet, put my hand up and broke my wrist. And I didn't cry the whole time. That was the only time I've ever been to hospital and didn't cry at all. And then my dad, as a joke, I got my x-ray and he said, if I had my x-ray, I wasn't allowed to have a Chinese takeaway. And then I cried. Oh, then the tears came. Oh, gosh. (laughs) And he was only joking. And he was like, wow, the only time you cried, I was like, my true greed has now been completely... Do you know, it's revealed. Of my dad, when my dad had all kinds of issues, um, he had all sorts of different sorts of illnesses, and he was in that hospital a lot. And the one time I got, I saw him like genuinely upset was when he was told that he wasn't allowed to have any more um, uh, fruit drinks <laughs> like, and sweets. <laughs> He had a sweet tooth. I'm yeah, sorry, really don't take tooth. away our small pleasures. Yeah, we had to, we had to take away. He wasn't any more, allowed any more of his, you know, juices and all the sweets and no. everything. It's the one time out of all the things that he was in hospital for that I ever saw him got really upset about. <laughs> tremendous fail. So thanks for telling us that tremendous tale, Laura. And um, I think it's really important as well that the children realise that everybody makes mistakes. And I always say that sometimes people learn more from the things that go wrong. I know I certainly have. Sure. Um, so we're wondering if you've got a tremendous fail that you'd like to share share with us. 
I do, but I don't want... Um, well, you've just added that little bit in where we're saying, you know, this isn't a regret. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because we kind of know what 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 ends, you know, if it's something happens at the end. So, like, it's a fail, but it's not a regret. Let's okay. be clear. So, picture the scene. I'm in year five at school, so this is I'm kind of ten years old. For up until this point, this is before my now husband came into my life, Hugo. I met him <laughs> when I was fourteen. So, before that, since I was four to ten, so six years, I was in love with this boy called Ricky, who was in my school, and uh, he had come from Romania, and I decided I was going to be living in Romania with him I was ready to go I was completely in love with him (laughs) he uh, did not feel the same way about me at all Um, but you know his loss but you know at this time I should say I was the Spice Girls had just come out and I was like really you know on that girl power Mm -hmm. that independent woman business and I was like you know what I've only got one shot at life right (laughs) so I'd liked him for a long time we were about to go into year six and then Ricky and I were going to be split and then it would be secondary school. So it's like, this is kind of my last chance to make a go of things. Okay. I also should tell you that my head at this time was infested by knits. So I was a really good landlord. I let them do whatever they wanted up in there. <laughs> um, my to be mum, fair, it's quite difficult to get rid of them. <laughs> oh, I just let them, I just gave in. So I let right. you tenants, you just do what you want up there. My mum didn't get on so well with the knits and she hacked all my hair off. So it was like really short. And also my mum was a punk. So it was really punky and short and very, loads of ball patches <laughs> also um my we didn't have to wear a uniform at my primary school which always kids go oh, that's so cool it's like not cool because it's really hard to look cool every day on your you know too your many decisions self, right? to make decisions yeah. to worry what everyone's gonna think anyway so my mum's friend had given me an all denim uh really fitted dress with buttons from the top down to the bottom like dip 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 dip, dip all the way down mm-hmm. and I was as you know, had a uh, jacket potato addiction. So I looked like a kind of sausage meat stuffed into a sock, <laughs> uh, an insecure meatball. And um, <clears throat> it was Friday, which meant fish fingers, chips and beans. And this was oh, the day so I was going to tell Ricky about my feelings for him. Yeah. But I thought I'll do it after lunch because I want this real lunch just to be able to, you know, gorge it out and then I'll do it in the afternoon. Well, Friday's always so, fish, isn't it? Fish and chips. Fish and chips, fish yeah. fingers. I also had that feel good Friday feeling. Lunch happened. <laughs> rammed it all down I was wearing the tight dress sat there in class and I said so Ricky um it's been obvious you know obvious to me anyway there's something between us there's a chemistry um I've been listening to Spice Girls don't know if you know who they are but (laughs) they're quite empowering and um I just want to nip this in the bud before we go our separate ways you know we Mm -hmm. go you go on to your you know secondary school me go on to mine uh will you be my boyfriend and he um drew his arm so far back and punched me (gasps) in the arm as his response. Right. I also wasn't popular. I was like kind of just me and my friend Siobhan. Um, The sick out of nowhere just rolled up into my throat and I absolutely projectile vomited on every single wall. The display splodgling down onto the ground. It just kept coming. It just wouldn't stop. Then I was crying in the sick going, is it a yes or is it a no? like this my friend Siobhan she's so loyal she's still my friend to this day we've I've been friends for I need 30 to talk, years I need to ask you about Ricky oh right so yeah so it's, he was just there like scowling like trying to look cool and I was my friend was cleaning up the sick anyway oh. uh, that was that and it was terrible oh this he'd already uh, sprayed a can of deodorant in my air freshener sorry in my face once uh, when we went to go knock for him to ask him again if he wanted to be my boyfriend oh, no. anyway then eventually I got over it it was fine about Six years ago, maybe less, I saw him at a bus stop and he was like, hey, Laura. And do you know what? He shouted out to me and I was looking so fresh that day. I just carried on walking. I just looked at him and I just carried on walking. And I was like, okay. And I was there in my little self. like I was like, zig a zig ah, basically. Zig a zig out of my life. So you weren't tempted to sort of say, just pretend that you just, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. Or, or, oh. No, I just looked back. I just looked back into the dust, like... No, probably because if I'd spoken, it would have been like, oh, is it a yes or is it a no? <laughs> I'm sorry, I was sick on you. <laughs> Were you actually sick on him or just sick around? Everywhere. everywhere. Oh, everywhere. Okay. Oh. If it everywhere. had been on it him, was literally... that might have been okay. In my memory, it was, you know, like in a cartoon where someone, like, peels the sick off their face oh. and has to, like, splat it down, like... <laughs> 
And it was fish fingers, chips and bean stick. It was because also the dress was so tight. Yeah. It was too tight, you know. Yeah, but I should so, have worn that dress. But. So you're calling it a tremendous fail, but actually in the with with the end bit, when you got, you know, like Ricky, Ricky missed out. Tremendous badass girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. It sounds like that to me. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> that's what I was going to say anyway. I'm <laughs> yeah, just saying I, what everyone's I, thinking, Liz. <laughs> I think that's, that's a brilliant story. And one to remember that actually, um, you know, how the, the feelings that you had about your friends and what happened to you when, when you were in primary school. So when children are sort of going through school life now, you know, thinking, not thinking... Um, the, the stories and the things that are happening to them now that you know you really use them don't you you use them for stories later on and you can totally. bring those but you bring back those memories they're so strong don't aren't they totally they really are and all those feelings you know that everything feels like thunder and lightning in your chest you know nothing is small like the smallest you know fancying somebody liking someone not knowing what to do with these feelings it's so huge and we, we spoke to um, Owen Colfer and he was talking about, he said something that was very poignant when he was talking about when you're a kid, you know everything in your garden, like or wherever in your house, you know where everything is, you know, you know, you, you know, but all those small details that just are really important to you that you kind of forget sometimes when you're older because you're too it's busy. It's so true. Faffing around. <laughs> it's so true. Oh, well, that's a brilliant, tremendous fail. And it's not really a fail. So we like we like that particularly. Well done. So we have this really groundbreaking segment of the podcast, which is called What's That Sound? So let's have a listen and tell us what you think it might be, Laura. Okay. I'm going to say it's a flag in the wind. Oh, that's an interesting one. Should we play it again? Let's have another. Okay, is it something boiling? Oh. Pasta boiling? <laughs> I love to say, Laura, you can't see Laura, but she's had her eyes closed and she was really <laughs> concentrating that. It is, it is actually, I think it's a, a bowl of, it's a, some pasta, because I knew that you were very yeah. keen on cooking. We decided we're trying to make the sound effects. Like I think it's slightly. pasta boiling. It's boiling pasta. Yeah, it's very relaxing, yes. actually, isn't it? Really relaxing. Yeah, letters. So I've got here as well, I like to read out letters from children. And I picked out this one in particular. This is quite actually, this is this was sent to me by somebody called Megan Queen. And I thought her name was something like out of it's a bit like Darcy Burdock you know it's got like that kind of ring about it hasn't it um and I just wanted to show you this I will actually put a picture of this up on uh my the podcast with her but she designed this look at this and I know that you particularly like wearing very colorful outfits and we like a bit of color don't we Laura wow it's like um the, I mean, it's like something psychedelic that you'd want to wear on a velvet it's, jumpsuit. Isn't it? I mean, literally, totally. I could put that, I can, I'm literally putting that on me and thinking that could be yeah. a shirt, a dress. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I'm going to tell... A wedding dress, something to wear to a funeral. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I've got this other letter here from, um, from Audrey. So Audrey says, uh, I've always thought that my mum and dad were a little bit like Derek's mum and dad because they are... They always interrupt me and my friends. Do you know anyone like that? So I thought I'd ask you, Laura, as well. Do you know anyone who interrupts you all the time? My, um, Me, my mum and my sister, when we talk, I don't know what we're saying. We're all just talking over each other at the speed of lightning. The speed of light, speed of lightning, whatever it is. It's just constant. So I take partake in that. And actually, sometimes I don't mind it because I do think when I see us in my head... I think of that as like a busy action kind of field table where there's loads of love going on and storytelling. And actually, sometimes when you are telling a story like nattering, it's kind of nattering. Mm -hmm. It's like you're not really saying anything of true weight. You're just nattering. That is a feeling you're trying to get across, not the actual story in itself. Is your sister younger or older? She's younger and we're exactly the same. She's just everything cooler. Um, But... um, (laughs) I, so I don't mind it in that way. And and actually, I think it kind of shows that you're like, you know, it's like a tug of war, which I don't really mind that a little bit with them. Unless you're trying to get something off your chest and then my mum's being, she, my mum has the art of being a devil's advocate. So sitting on the fence, you know, and you don't want to hear it and you want your mum to just be on your side and mm. be like, absolutely, you are the queen of the world. Um, <laughs> so 
I think parents have always got, I mean, it's, they've always got a way of pushing your buttons. It doesn't matter um, how old you are. And I think with your siblings as well, it doesn't matter how old you are. There's always that same sort of pecking order, isn't it? Because I'm the youngest. Oh, it's always a hierarchy. Yeah. Definitely. <clears throat> oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Mark's the youngest as well. Oh, um, sorry about that. <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, so this is like solidarity, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It doesn't matter what you do in your life. Like if you're the youngest, you always kind of get like treated the same way. Just a bit, you know, patting on the head. Like, well done. And also a bit spoiled though. Mm, pr- I think if you spoke to my brothers and sisters, they'd probably agree with that. Because like, there's a big age gap between me and my brothers and sisters as well. So like by the time I came along, my mum and dad were a bit more relaxed about things. This is it. Mm. I had to, to get my ears pierced to be able to get a bus on my own. Oh. I had to wait till I was like 109. <laughs> and they're just like doing it straight away. It's like my mum doesn't, I'm like, where's Hector? She'd be like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, right, okay, this is different. Oh, because <laughs> you've got a brother as well. I've got a sister and a brother. I'm the oldest. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you're paving the way, aren't you? Exactly. <clears throat> what a way I paved. <laughs> <laughs> do you write about them? Do you ever write about them in your books? Have you, you, you All do? the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All the time. And do they know about that? that they've... Oh, yes. <laughs> Sometimes I don't even, can't even bother to even change their name. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting though, isn't it? Like the, the stories that we're, a lot of the stories, I mean, I do the same thing with my books that, you know, I'm, I'm really drawing on those experiences, on those relationships and things that you have with your brothers and sisters, with your family life, because I know that's something that you, you write, you've, you've written you about as well. You have to. You have to. To be a, a good writer, I think it's not even just about, you know, it's not, yeah, it helps to put nice words in the right order, but really you're just drawing on your own memory. It, it, memory is the most important skill as having a writer because, you know, if you are writing, for example, about love or about being fear, we talked about, you know, bullying or isolation, loneliness, any of these experiences, Experiences, you're trying to get convey something that is so importantly to you you have to remember and evoke all those feelings how can you do that without drawing upon your own experience I also think the art of writing and reading is a an agreement right so you share a little bit for the reader to share a little bit so it is in that space that's where the trust is created and even if you're writing from a from the point of view of a zebra it still has to be true <laughs> Very true. No, that's absolutely, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, no, that, I completely agree with that. Um, so that brings us on, Laura, to your tremendous book recommendation. So what book would you like to recommend? Um, I Actually, you might have already read this. I'm sorry if you have, but I loved Julian is a Mermaid. And so I've recommended the second, uh, which is Julian at the Wedding oh, I've not um, seen by that. Jessica Love. Oh, it's amazing. Um, so it's beautiful um sophisticated um amazing illustrations um with hardly any words and some don't have words at all i mean they're just simply i mean you can see wow how amazing that is with just you know no words needed and for me i'm overuse words so much you know so just to see this kind of transformation of julian becoming ready for the wedding um it's just gorgeous so laura's holding um, up the book and i'll, I'll do, we'll put yeah. a link to that book up and it's just celebratory and just an amazing book and we love it at home. So I wanted to recommend that. What kind of books did you read when you were younger then, Laura? I was a massive, well, I still am a massive mm. Jacqueline Wilson fan. Oh, that's um, I'm doing and, like, like, you've probably met Jacqueline, haven't you? I've shared a packet of biscuits oh with the my, chick, to be honest with oh, you. Oh. <laughs> Um, she's amazing. She's as amazing in real life and as commanding and wise and funny and everything that she is in her books her rings are ridiculous I was just about to mention her rings yeah I remember her, her saying oh you know she was kind of fiddling with something she went sorry I'm just trying to sort something out at home one of my baths is broken one of my baths <laughs> and I was like okay Ooh. okay okay um but she's oh my god incredible so uh, I, I still am a massive Jacqueline Wilson fan I was took something really do you know, challenging to read on a holiday once. And I don't know why I did it to myself. And I just was like, what am I going to do? This is my only book. And in the hotel, they had like a selection of books you could read. Mm. And Lola Rose was there by Jacqueline Wilson, which I hadn't read. And I just could have cried. I was like, oh, thank you. So I can read this. Um, and still her stories just mean so much to me, you know. Um, 
I know. I so, remember as well. It's like uh, Nick Sharrett who does all the illustrations. Yeah, they're so you know that you you just recognise them so much. And I used to see his work. Um, he used to do work drew drawings in Cosmopolitan magazine as well. <clears throat> That's where he first started doing illustrations. And like then we saw it on Tracy Beaker. And there's just something about seeing those like his illustrations with the books. They just go perfectly, don't they? They really do. And it's not trying to be anything pretentious or like, you know, it's just is what it is. And it's just beautiful. And the illustrated mum, for example, you know, what I love so much about Jackie's work is she is unapologetically unafraid to talk about all the big heavy stuff, which really Mm. does make the world go round, which if we ignore that stuff and pretend it doesn't happen, we're only hurting ourselves and damaging ourselves more. And Jackie does it with such a lightness of touch, but such honesty and facing of all the unknown right in the eye. And that's the sort of stuff that kids need to see. Yeah, it's incredible. I took my um, both my girls when they were younger. We went to see her talking, doing an event. She's an amazing and, talker. You know, I mean, when I do events, I felt so unconfident about doing them in the beginning. And so I used to, you know, I bring lots of stuff. So I've got things to do, things to point out. And she was incredible. There was just this room full, you know, I don't know, over a thousand children. And it was just her sitting on the stage, just talking and telling her stories. And they were all absolutely wrapped and listening to every yeah. single word. And I just thought, wow, that's incredible. Like that. She being... does. She comes with nothing except yeah. herself. And she's slogged as well, you know. Every yeah. few, I'm sure you've been to all the libraries around the UK and every librarian has a story of her being, you know, waiting for the trains in the storm, carrying all her books in bags. And she's she's done the graft. Like, she's amazing. She's I know. amazing. It's always as well, because, you know, she brings out, you know, one, one I think it's about one book a year. And it's just so consistent and we almost take it for granted, you know, like Tracy Beaker's was such a, uh, I don't know how old it is, it's probably about 20, 20 years old, something like that. Probably more, And I'd then say. just to have that consistency, bringing out one book after the other every single year that just really touches that whole new generation of children is incredible. So this is turning into the sort of Jacqueline Wilson love fest, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's what we're going to call it. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> no, I used to feel like that about um, uh, like uh, Quentin Blake's drawings as well. Just and getting incredible. the incredible. Opp- Did you? Oh, I mean, I, you have the opportunity was, to meet them. It's so amazing, isn't it? We get the opportunity to meet some of the our favourite authors, and I'm still like, you know. <gasps> I just got to show some because I'm doing a Guardian Masterclass at the moment of yeah. for children's writing, and I just got to show them people that had never seen Sad Book for the first time. <gasps> and if you've never picked up Sad Book. It just breaks every rule of what a children's book is, I'm saying with bunny ears, like meant to look like, you know, Mm. it's grey, it's muddy, it's bleak, it's just, uh, it's devastating. And again, what we were just saying with Jackie's work, you know, it's going, this is, you can't have light without shade and let's lean into the shade and try and understand it rather than pretend it doesn't exist. Remarkable book. And I love Michael Rosen too. Oh, this is true. We're just, we're just sort of fangirling like all these. We are, sorry. Shameless plug. So well, I think I think it's about time we got back and we started to talk about all your wonderful books and your wonderful <laughs> achievements. So this is now your opportunity. We're going to hand it over to you, Laura, to do a shameless plug. So you can oh. tell us about everything that you want to and all the amazing things and all the amazing books that you're, you've been working on. Why is my brain going, tell them about all the embarrassing things you've ever done? <laughs> um, so, um, no, um, so most recently my book, The Lipstick, came out, which is a picture book um, illustrated by Maria Carapidu, who I did Angry Cookie with. And it's just about a little boy who gets kind of bossed about, dictated by a lipstick that makes him illustrate his house. Um, and uh, I'm also doing, my book Butterfly Brain just came out as well, which is about a little boy that won't stop leaning back on his chair he cracks his head open and it makes him he has to go and find his memories his dreams um his imagination and put it all back into his head but there's something else that he's missing that he's trying to not put back in his head because he'd rather not revisit it um and then I'm, i've just got a new book coming out with the same publishers called dream house which is um a story of grief as well um 
Oh, well, but actually, weirdly, mentions the Marmite story in it, oh. of the Marmite being on my godfather's um, table because it's all about setting his garden. My godfather, when I was younger, built me uh, and my sister a shed. He doesn't have children of his own. He built us a shed in his garden called the Dream House. Wow. Where we could just sit and um, he put two desks in there, a bit like the old-fashioned ones with the inkwells, and he would put games in there and magazines and sweets and everything, and a little heater and oh old God, carpet that brilliant. he found it's from like- a skip. It's a dream. Like, it's a luxury like, yeah. dream. And by it was a little pond with all frogs spawning and a big willow over the top. And this was in Kew. And um, we drive all the way from Brixton to Kew, which just felt like the longest journey ever, <laughs> like we're going to the woods. And, uh, and yeah, and then today. that's where... That's where a lot of my, my dad and him would just sit there and drink beers in the garden and chill and we'd just be there, like, you know, living out our dreams. So um, when I bought my first, um, my my house, um, he was actually, good. there was going to be an arrangement to get the dream house delivered from his <gasps> house to mine um, yeah. to live in there. But actually, I can't move it, you know. It actually won't be moved. It actually would fall apart. Um, but <laughs> it can't be moved, you know, for poetic reasons. It's going to have um, a so- blue plaque on the side of it very soon. <laughs> So that's um, so that's that's what's coming next. But you know, I, I my thing that I'm probably most proud of is making a three year old. Thank God I've got through the baby years and I've got a little person now, a friend. Aww. So that's my biggest achievement. Whew, that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone listening, you lot are hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then we when they get older, you think when they get older, it's going to get easier though. <laughs> Liz, Liz, I don't know about your kids, but also Jet can't stand my books. Whenever Hugo, my partner, goes, should we read one of Mummy's books? He goes, no, I don't want to read that. I want to read Where the Wild Things Are. And I'm like, right. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's just, that's just something, like I said, children will always find those buttons to press that you have <laughs> they find your weakness they do they do they my kids um it was quite handy though because actually i've put an awful lot of things that happened to them in the tom gates books my kids have listened to them on audiobook but the actual pick you know picking them up and reading them i was once on a train with lily and i was like she was like oh you know she couldn't get any internet or you know everything had run out and uh, we were going to uh, she's coming to an event with me and she goes oh i've got nothing to do and i said I've got a book you can read. Do you want to read one of these? And she was like, oh, God, all right. So she sort of took a Tom Gates book and sort of started reading a few pages. And she went, oh, it's actually all right. <laughs> it's not- and why is that the biggest compliment you've ever had? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like, that bad, Bye. actually. It's all right. And also picture books as well. Like when the kids were little, I was rushing around. Like if they were going to a party and I'd forgotten to buy a present, I'd do that thing where I'd like, oh, I know. Oh, I say, well, should I give them one of my picture books? And they go like, oh, God, Mum, can you not just give them a real present? <laughs> The like five in a card. <laughs> the burn. It's so yeah. bad, isn't it? Yeah. And th- their friends would come around and they'd all be fascinated. You know, they'd be like, oh, you know, drawing all the paints and everything around. But like they were just like, oh, God, I should just watch telly or, you know, it's not really that interesting. Totally, I think that's proper totally. order though, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think that means like, that's how, exactly, that's how it's meant to go down. I could totally agree with you. And the thing is, they'll, you know, they'll be looking at what you and your partner do now and everything around them. They'll be soaking it all up. And even if you don't think that they're taking it all in, they are. And they'll have their own kind of stories and <laughs> things that they'll be remembering about you know what's been going on so and even if they say that they're not interested they will be they will be that's what I tell myself Liz it's true as I'm crying as I fall asleep <laughs> Laura I'm very aware we've taken up an absolute ton of your time being I'm so late time. right okay so I'm gonna say that let's go so Laura you've been absolutely fantastic and a delight oh. to chat to and we'd oh, love so to give you. you also I'm looking around for it personally so we're, we're gonna send to you a little um podcast package which will include a red Tom Gates badge for all your creativity <laughs> Laura thank you so much for sharing all your tremendous tales fails books stories advice and snacks with us and you can find a link to all the books that Laura's been recommending including her own on my website and if you want to get in touch and tell me your tremendous tale fail or share a tremendous doodle then go to lizpichon.com so once again thanks to lovely laura and thank you for listening thank you so much (laughs) 